To Fin Suite Live. Wow, we are at another record again. This is now the second most waiting viewers we've ever had. So thank you for tuning in. That's really nice. Today we are with Jonas, and we're going to go over Wiz Clonables and announce how you can get early access to the early access. Before we do that, I will make it clear that Jonas and I are in this same room right now. We are together in real life. That's super cool. We are in Florida, United States for State of Flow, and we get to do this episode together. So that's really cool. Okay. Before we say hello to the crowd, before we get in, into any of the content, let's just give some announcements here. First, Thursday, Community Day, we will not be live. Community Day this week is canceled. We are mentally preparing for State of Flow. We have some people from FinSuite coming, so no stream on Thursday. We will have a stream Friday. This is Friday morning, 9 Eastern. That's going to be a build day with Alex Iglesias, and that is going to be how to use JavaScript frameworks inside Webflow. And we're going to be focusing on Svelte, which is FinSuite's recommended web app builder with code. So, great. Let's say hello to Jonas. Jonas, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Uh, feels great to be here in Florida. Um, really happy to do this live stream today. And uh, yeah, can't wait to share more about WIST. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we announced this exactly one week ago, and we have had an overwhelming amount of responses and positive feedback and people asking, how do I get access? What do I do? What's the process? I need it for this. I'm working on a project and need it tomorrow. I mean, the, the amount of messages that we got is amazing. And we, we have some plans on how to approach that. So this episode is going to give you a little bit of a walkthrough and what V2 is. We're going to go through clonable examples. And I think before we do that, we're going to share our early access, most passionate users form. So what this is, is a way for you to tell us how passionate you are about using Wiz. And we've decided that we're going to choose the early access users based on who is the most passionate. So we're going to say hello to the crowd Then we're going to share this link and let's start saying hello to everybody. We have a lot of people here today and also we're at a hundred viewers. So Gabe, let's get that hundred viewer animation here. That's effing sweet. Nice. That's what I like to hear. Okay. Let's bring up these comments. Who do we have live here? Dennis Karg, hello, super excited to have you here, Dennis, thank you. We have Mo, curious what clonables it will be. Okay, well, wait about five minutes or so and we'll see. We have Yaroslav, hello, welcome, welcome. We have Mark, let's go, nice. Nicola, hello, Michael Rose, hello, hello. Who else we have, Robert, nice to see you. Mir T, so eager to watch this. Good. Penny, what's up? There are a lot of eager people waiting for this stream. You know, there are. Absolutely. That's why we're doing it. Roch, hello. Let's put a few more up and then we'll get down to business. Greg Dolan, hello, hello. Joseph, what's up? And we'll do one more here. Parker Thompson, hello. Okay, great. So I'm going to share this Airtable form here. We have this Airtable form and it's going to it's going to let you tell us why you want to be a WISD user. What is your purpose for using WISD? 
we are going to hand select the most passionate users, the most passionate people. And those people are going to get access earlier than the less passionate people. So tell us what's up, tell us why you want it. And the earlier access users were really going to be working with one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to get really special support. You're going to get really special everything to make sure that the first people using Wiz have a really good experience. So go on, fill out that form. You can fill it out more than once. It's not just a one-time entry. If you want to fill it out four times, you can do that. Uh, you can define what passion it is and we'll, we'll decide who gets picked for that. So Jonas, are you ready? I am. Great. Okay. So now we are going to go into screen share mode. Jonas is going to be leading this presentation and I'm going to be jumping in with questions as somebody who is not an active Wiz user and Jonas will be explaining what this is, why it works. And yeah, let's go to screen share here, Gabe. Nice. First app, weather app. Jonas, take it away. All right. So um, we have a lot of clonables lined up for you that we will release in the coming weeks. But today I want to take the opportunity to share with you two of them, just to uh, walk you through how to build an app with Wist, how a built app looks like, and how those clonables will look like when we release them. And uh, I picked two clonables today that we are going to talk about. And uh, the first one is a really simple weather application. What it allows you to do is simply to enter a city like London over here, and you get the weather currently in London. You can also input Tampa, where we are right now, and we will get the weather for Tampa. It's 32 degrees outside and uh, really warm actually today. All right. A uh, second application that I will walk you through afterwards is regarding um, yeah, user logins. And in this episode, we're going to cover Superbase. So we're going to learn how to build a login system with Superbase in WIST. And uh, this login system will be used for a job application dashboard. And now, Jonas, both of these will be available as free clonables once we launch publicly, correct? Yes, both of them and many more. So um, you can already check out on our website the WIST Showcase, WIST.com. And then if you go into the menu, WIST Showcase, um, there you will already see, I think, nine of our clonables lined up. Um, it's not only a weather app. It's not only a job application dashboard. It will be much more like we, we asked back in... Back in, uh, I think in February, we asked our existing WIST user base what kind of clonables they want to see. And basically, this now is the result of our submissions we got back then. So, um, yeah, we, we collected your feedback and we're going to build more and more over time. So, we, are, we have like those nine, I think, that are featured right now on the homepage. Uh, we have another, I think, 12 starter kits lined up or even more. I'm not 100% sure about the numbers. Um, which starter kits will cover basically common use cases with databases that we integrate and also that we don't integrate. So um, where REST API connections are needed, we will cover a lot of those use cases with our starter kits. And um, other than that, we're just going to continue building more and more clonables depending on what you want to see. So if you want to see specific clonables and you don't see them already on our website under our showcase, and they are probably not included in the starter kits, then feel free to write us and we will make sure to get them out for you. We're also going to be receiving some ideas in that Airtable form that we shared. So that the, the pin comment, the Airtable form, tell us your use case. If we see a whole bunch of people asking for the same use case, we may just make a clonable for this. Uh, just like Webflow and it's relatively easy and lightweight to build something, the same applies for Wiz. So it may just take us one or two days to fulfill a request that many people have. So go ahead and share your ideas, share your use cases in that Airtable link. Okay, Jonas, are we ready to get started here? I am. I think we are. So let's get started. Um, those clonables that I will share today are pre-built already. So we're not going to walk through the full build process. But I'm going to share with you how uh, 
um, a pre-built app looks like and how requests and wills look like, how you can explore the different panels. Uh, you will basically just see it in action and you will see a, a pre-built app and functionality in action inside of WIST in the configurator. So let me start with the weather application. Um, in this weather application, you can see I'm on the My Apps panel right now. And we have here our Airtable base and our Open Weather Map API. Open Weather Map API is a simple, free to use weather API that we're using to getting this information. And it's especially this endpoint over here. And then, um, yeah, we're using that endpoint later in a data in request, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Jonas, can I stop you here and ask you to zoom in once on your screen just to get a little bit more visibility? Like this? Yeah, I think that looks good. Thanks. All right. So uh, let me now jump into data in. So again, my apps was the general application connections. We have a connection for Airtable and we have this REST API where we put in the base URL of the REST API. And then we have our data in requests. And to fetch this data from our API, we will need two requests. The first request is for loading the weather from our open weather map API. And here we are specifically targeting the endpoint data slash 2.5 slash weather. We are performing a get request and we have some URL parameters that are basically the configuration of the request for the endpoint. So what we are doing here, first of all, we have the queue parameter. This is, by the way, all explained in the API documentation of the Open Weather API. So we're not coming up with some new keys or values here. That's basically just um, the instructions that the Open uh, Weather Map API told us how we need to call this API. And it's all public source and available for free online. So they told us to use the queue parameter um, as a URL parameter. And in here, we want to pass the city name. And how we pass in a city name in WIST is fairly simple. First of all, we made sure that we have our WIST element in Webflow. So if you go to that form, you see that we have the WIST element city name. So WIST element city name. And that is basically our default form input element in Webflow. And then what we are doing in WIST is basically we go into our value selector over here. And in here, we open up general, we open up input fields, and WIST is automatically recognizing the available input fields with the WIST element here. And even the value is pre-filled out. So we know OK, we want to use this input field as the value for our query. And let me quickly delete this. You can just simply click on that input field and it will appear in your data selector. So that's how we put in the name of the city that we want to look for. Then the second parameter that this API is requiring us to add is the app ID. And this is also another parameter that we just need to add and it's static. So there's no var variable over here. It's just a simple string that we need to add and that is um, yeah, required by this API. And then we want to return the metrics, um, the units in metric. Uh, we could also yeah, change this, but for now we are returning them in metric units. And that's basically already the full request on how we get the information from our server. And uh, when I go to response now over here, you can see a full list of all the data that we get back from this API. It looks really complicated on first glance, but if you look a second time, it gets much more simple. So first of all, this is basically just an identifier of this request, which means request two, as you can see, it has the ID of two over here. And then the D indicates that we are looking for request data basically the return data. There's also a request status, which is available with this dollar sign over here. But we are looking for the data now. And uh, let me give you a quick overview about what we get back, back here. So for example, we get back um, the, the main weather, which says it's clouds right now, which we also see over here. 
we see it's scattered clouds, which we also display later over here. And of course, we got the temperature. So we got the temperature. Um, let me quickly check where that here under main dot temperature. And uh, so we got, see 32 degrees. And then what we also get back and what we will use in our second request to Airtable is the icon ID, basically the ID of this um, condition that we are experiencing right now, scattered clouds. And this ID for the icon is 03D. It's just an ID code that this API is providing. We didn't come up with it. It's just the open weather map API code that they provide for specific conditions. And what we did now is we created a simple Airtable table with this data, and we added our own custom icons for each of those conditions. So as we, we saw here, we got back um, a 03D icon from our um, open weather map API. And now we're going to use this data and load the right attachment, basically the right icon for that. So we're not getting um, the icon from the initial open weather map API, but we're getting it from our own icon library that we created for this clonable. And this is the second request, get icon. Let me walk you through it. So we have this uh, get icon request over here. I selected the app that we have in my apps, our Airtable connection. Then we selected database as an API type. We want to get an item list because we want to search for the specific icon. And we want to use our WIST weather widget base and our table one. And now in the filter, you can see basically how we search for this icon in our table. So first of all, we select that it should include, it should look for the icon name, which is basically our column over here. And then we want to only return the item that equals basically the code that we got back, which is weather icon. And then we added just a PNG at the end. So basically to match exactly this icon name over here. And uh, yeah, that's basically already it for our second request. And the second request is then just returning the original Airtable data, which includes a lot of data regarding the attachment itself, like attachment thumbnails, attachment size, attachment file name. But the one we're looking for is the URL. So this one over here, which is the attachment URL. And this URL allows us to embed and show the icon later in the WIS configurator. Really nice. And let me ask you a question, Jonas. This, this is data in. So mm -hmm. this is going and requesting information from another source, right? Correct. And this is, we're not yet, we have not actually done anything with the website yet. We haven't actually put any of this data on the site. We are just bringing data in. So if you're a Zapier user, you connect your account and then you do the test, right? You do that little test trigger and then it goes and gives you a big list of all the things that are returned in that request. This is kind of a similar thing here, right? Where we're bringing this data in. It's exactly the same. Great. Yeah. And uh, now, first of all, I'm going to talk to you on how we trigger those requests, actually, because we not want to randomly fire them just by visiting the page. We want to fire them when this value here in the input field is changed. So whenever I type in a new um, city, like New York now, for example, we want to rerun our request. And how we do that is with actions. So we're going to get into this panel now. Actions, it's, it's pretty simple. Any Anytime you want to change anything on your canvas, which is this view over here, you need actions for that. Any change of any text, any value, any class, any style, everything goes through actions. And also to trigger specific things, that's also going through actions. So we have this action over here, which I gave the name trigger weather load. And this connection is fairly simple as well. So first of all, we are again looking for our city name um, attribute. 
which we put in here into this form element. And this is basically the element we want to apply this connection to. Then we go into our configuration for the action. And in here, we selected a setting on change. And on change, we want to perform a request. So we want to trigger our load weather request. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Every time this input field changes, we are triggering and re-performing this load weather request. And then, because we changed those two, uh, we chained those two requests to first get the weather and then get the icon. Of course, we need to make sure that also our get icon request is fired. And we do that by going into data in. We go into our load weather request, and here we have a handy after request selection. That doesn't have something to do with the UI. That's why it's not in actions, but it has to do with requests, and that's why it's in this request setting. And in here, we say that simply after this request, we want to perform a new request. And in here, we select the conditions that we make sure that the status of our first request was successful. I'm not going to go into deep, um, very deep into that. That uh, will be explained all by the tutorials from Emmanuel, like regarding formulas and conditions. But uh, for now, it, you can just remember it as a condition that makes sure that the previous request was successful. And if this condition is met, we want to execute the get icon request as well. So they both run after another. And once they are run, they display the data. How do they display the data? I'm going to talk about that now. So we go into actions again. And we discussed our trigger weather load already. Now what we want to do is we want to set the weather icon whenever uh, to, the right, to the right loaded um, icon from Airtable. And to do that is fairly simple. We again have our action settings, which are all built in the same way. We want to apply our action to one element, in that case, weather icon. And then we want to uh, have some configuration on the element. In that case, we want to replace the image, which is simply uh, to set an HTML attribute, set the key, and then set the key to the loaded attachment URL that we got from Airtable in our request. And this is similar for all the other connections that we made over here. So for the temperature as well, we have a set temperature action. We apply it to weather temperature, which again is simply an attribute we added to this temperature here, with element weather temperature. And uh, to this attribute, then we apply the set text setting, plain text. And in here, we have a quick formula uh, because we want to round that temperature. Um, if you remember, originally, temperature was um, a data type float with a, a 21.88. And we want to round it up. So that's 22 and a little bit simpler and cleaner. And we are simply using JavaScript in here. So math round. And uh, yeah, we can use JavaScript in those input fields. Um, yeah, and basically, it's the same for all the other um, details that we added to this view over here on the right. So we have a set condition, which shows the condition. We have set details, which shows the details. Um, and uh, we have one additional setting, which is show and hide the weather, because we want to hide this part whenever the requests are performing. So we have an attribute called weather for that, which is the parent of all the other attributes. And uh, to this attribute, we applied the configuration set visibility. And uh, we basically only show it if both requests are not executing right now. So it's a simple um, and formula that is um, yeah, working with the request states that we have in here. Emmanuel will also go into details about all of those formulas and uh, will tell you how to use them properly. You can basically use um, yeah, plain JavaScript in here in those formulas. And that's also why, of course, a little bit of coding and a little bit of basic knowledge about JavaScript will get you much further here. Really nice. OK, we have some questions. Let's take a little break and answer some of these questions that are related to this weather app or just WISD in general. Let's bring up the first one from Arcadia's. Palki. 
This question is, can you explain for a non-dev person, what is the advantage of automating with Wiz versus automating with an application like Make? Okay. So um, I would say Make and Wiz both have pretty different use cases. You can think of Make as a backend, which enables you to run cron jobs like automatic synchronizations between multiple tools in the background. Uh, you can also use Make for REST requests. So you can use webhooks inside of Make that enables you to load data from a front end, for example, uh, from Make. And um, from Make, from another tool, like you could connect pretty much any SaaS tool to Make and then perform this webhook request, which returns data to your front end or to your endpoint. And Wiz has a different use case. Wiz is, is built as a front end framework for Webflow. So it enables you to basically apply data to your front end. Um, it's not a back end request execution um, program. It doesn't let you build like complex logic flows of requests. It's made to load data in and bring data out of your front end. Great. That's a great answer. And it leads right into some other questions about view. We've had a few questions about view. Let's bring one of them in. Let's bring it up from, from Nicola. Will it be possible to integrate custom view components if features are still not available? So Jonas, view, what, like, why, why would we use or not use view with Wiz? So I'm a big view fan in general. Uh, Wiz is built with view. This overview here is with view. It's a, a view application in the background powering the configurator. So I'm generally a big fan of it. Um, and I'm not sure how technical you are asking this question, but in case you are very technical, have worked with view in the past and know how to integrate it into Webflow, then you can still continue doing that. There will be no limitations with Wiz that prevent you from doing so. You can still use it for custom components. Wiz has a JavaScript API where you can use data coming into Wiz or coming out of Wiz, uh, where you can trigger requests and just work with Wiz as an extension. I imagine if you're familiar with Vue already, you can simply use our JavaScript API to work with the data parts that are controlled by Wiz. Okay, so then let's bring up a comment that I made a little bit before and let's see if this is not correct. Uh, so I said in the comments a little bit earlier, Samso Studios, no, this is not a use case of Wiz using Vue with Wiz. And I said that Wiz can replace the use of Vue in Webflow. Is that true? That's correct. So that, that's what it's built for initially. Um, but I'm, I think when you ask that question, you maybe really know your way around code and maybe want to do some complex front end heavy calculations, some maybe image editing, some video editing, or just some, some really, really complex logic. And you think that Vue is the best fit for that. And if you want to do that, then you can still import and add a view component to your elements in Webflow. Uh, it's just that for most cases, for maybe 95% of web applications, this isn't required. And um, for, for those applications, there is no need to use view. And basically, actually, when I go back in time a little bit and think about what inspired me to build Wist, is I was building applications with view before, and I wanted to just bring the power of view to Webflow itself. And basically, if you check our actions and no view, then you will see a lot of um, similarities in the way how you can apply different settings to template elements of view when we talk about view. So you can basically change classes, you can set, change the text input, you can trigger actions with on-click actions or on input actions. And so it's, a, it's basically the no-code way of um, building that application and it's inspired by Vue and that's why we also call it a front-end framework for Webflow. Nice, love it. Okay, let's bring this up from Dennis Carr. QOL Q question, quality of life. If I rename the ID of an element, does Wiz automatically pull the new name of that item or do I have to reselect it? So um, I can maybe show you that right here. So let's say you just delete that with element over here and you republish. Uh, 
And let's say now we want to reload our configurator. Then you will see that our trigger weather load has some error in here, error locating attributes. And that will indicate that this specific action has some issues with its attribute, collect, attribute connection, and you can just reconnect it. So if you make a mistake, WIST is automatically checking for it, and we'll let you know WIST kind of, what kind of action broke and give you instructions on how to fix it. Great. So yes, if you used V1, WIS V1, this is completely different. The, the way that items are selected and the way that elements communicate between Webflow and WIS, completely redone. And this is much, much more effective. Let's bring up one from, from Spencer Kinsley. Kinsley. Uh, and there were a few questions about this. In this use case, can city be populated automatically by IP address? So in this weather example, instead of typing the, the location, mm -hmm. we just find out where that user is and display it right away. Yes, you can do that. Um, there's a simple way to do it. There are APIs that can give you back the location and the city name based on the request IP. And as um, REST requests here, are performed inside of the WIST front end and not on our server, if we don't specifically ask WIST to do it, um, you can basically just pick out an API that returns you the location for your request. There would be, if I do a simple Google search, we'll probably find um, a couple of vendors for it, probably a couple of them as well free, um, where you just would build a REST API request to their endpoint that would automatically give back the address or the the at least the city name of the user based on his ip and then you could just um, perform this request here afterwards so you would just have three requests for that use case um, the first one would be to get the location based on the ip by the rest api and the second one would be to load the weather based on the query which would be the city name you got back from your first request and then you would have the get icon request Okay, so unfortunately, we are having some streaming issues. Uh, I don't know why this has happened. This is now the second time it's happened to us. The good news is that when it happened last time, the actual video was perfectly recorded. So if you play back this video, there should be no issue with the playback. What we're actually saying here is being recorded. It's just not streaming properly. Uh, and we have cut our watch count in half. Uh, so let's just wait a minute here and we'll see when we can come back. Are we back? Okay. Not back yet. Okay, so wow, all right. Okay, so it, it really seems like this is an upload issue to YouTube. And it kind of looks like oh, we're not back. Damn. All right. Part of me wants to keep going for all the people watching in the future. And part of me says, wait until it comes back. Um, yeah, Dennis Karg, it looks like this is a problem on YouTube's part. All of your words are coming through, but very delayed. Yeah, I think so too, because on our streaming side, everything that we're seeing on our side is perfect. Okay. All right, we'll just give, we'll give a minute if you're watching back and everything is fine, just scrub through a little bit and we will wait until we are back live. And while we're waiting, I'll just remind everybody that Jonas and I are in the same room right here. I'm right next to him. And this was a really excellent walkthrough until this technical issue. Okay. I guess... I guess let's just answer a question. 
Um, Gabe, you know what? Let's go off of screen share. Last time that seemed to, to help a little bit. So let's go off of screen share. Let's go into podcast mode right now. And we'll just keep answering some questions. Um, this is a nice technical one. Let's bring this up. This is a great podcast question from Nicola Toledo. Out of curiosity, why did you choose Vue instead of React or other JavaScript frameworks? So I've personally worked with all of them in the past and made my experience with, um, with React and Vue. Um, I just found that personally I, I'm around like 20 to 30% faster with Vue as it has a little bit more boilerplate functions you can use. It's a little bit less bare bone than React and uh, that made it just the go-to tool for us. So it was a personal decision in terms of performance. Um, I don't think there are major differences. And I'm going to go off script a little bit and ask this question on Friday, we're going to be live with Alex Iglesias and we are going to cover Svelte inside Webflow. And when we're building a, a very custom web application for a client, we commonly use Svelte. So can you talk a little bit about the difference of why this is Vue based and why you developed based in Vue instead of Svelte? A little, little bit of a technical answer here. Um, yeah, so basically Svelte is a pretty new framework as well. Um, so uh, just to be honest, I didn't make the decision between uh, Vue and Svelte back in the time in, in 2020 when I started, 2019 when I started working on WIST. Uh, I, I don't even know if Svelte was already released back then. So um, yeah, I, I, I built applications before with React and Vue. Uh, I didn't look into Svelte back in the day. And uh, yeah, then we just stick with it. Yep, that's a good answer. Okay, and now it looks like we are back, fully back. Uh, unfortunately, we went from about 140 watch count to now 65. So all of you 65 people who are still here, thank you so much. Appreciate you sticking through these technical issues, but now let's get back into it. We went through the core questions inside this chat. So let's, um, let's finish up this weather example, and then let's start to transition into the next example. Okay. So I'm, I'm just going to um, pretend and, and think that this will all have been, um, been re have been recorded and will be available for you afterwards. So um, I will just, uh, I think, do we have any more questions regarding the weather example? No, I don't think so. Because we just finished, I think, answering the last question mm -hmm. when we had the stream issues. Yes. Um, and just for, for everybody that stuck that is still around, uh, the question was, can I, can I automatically show the weather based on the IP address? And the answer is yes. Yes. The power to write JavaScript in here. So the answer is absolutely. You can do anything with JavaScript. Yes. And, um, yeah, although you don't need JavaScript for that reason, you can st still do it in no code way. Uh, just use an API that returns you, um, the, the, the address and your loc your location data based on the request itself. And as Wiz is executing HTTP and REST requests from the client side in your browser, it basically will return the user IP, uh, the information based on the user IP. Great. Okay. So that's it for weather. Please go back and watch the recording. Uh, even though we had some live YouTube issues, it seems that everything is correct on our end. So this should upload really well for us. And now let's, uh, let's continue Jonas. All right. So I already teased it a little bit before, um, we are now going to build a login system and this login con system consists of three parts. Um, first of all, we will have a login. Second, we will have a sign up. And third, we will want to load the user information on our dashboard. So let me quickly dive into this. Again, we start with my apps. Here you can see that we have Superbase inside of our my apps. And you have the project URL from Superbase and the project API key. Don't worry, I'm not sharing anything 
uh, private tier, it's a public API key of Superbase that will also be shared with all of your users that are visiting the page. And uh, in here in Superbase, um, you get this information by going into your organization and then you go into your um, project that you created inside of Superbase and you have your um, yeah, public API key and your public URL of your Superbase database. All right, so that's it regarding integrating Superbase into WIST. Fairly simple, only two configuration options and it's done in under 30 seconds. Then what we want to do is we have our three pages. So we have our login page, we have our um, sign up page over here, and we have our dashboard page. And uh, now I'm going to walk you through on how it all looks like and how we basically make sure that our users are logged in and um, how it's all being done and secured by Superbase. So first of all, the first thing we do with any project is we add the required attributes. So we go to sign up first. We make sure that our email has the right attributes. In here, it's with element, sign up email, same for the password, sign up password. Um, then we have here one text input field that will be used later on to display possible errors during the sign up process. And then we have our button where we sign up, uh, where we can trigger basically the sign up request. Same we do for login, of course. Here again, we have our login email, we have our login password, login error code, and our login button. And now we go into WIST and we go to our authentication tab. And first of all, what you would do is you would select your app which would be Superbase. And then it gives you three options. Um, you can either create a user, log in a user, or load a user. And whenever you click on one of them, you will basically have a pre-built request for the specific action. So if I say I want to create a user, it's opening up the data out panel with a new request, create user, where we basically have already um, the right authentication method selected and we only need to connect the email and password input. I'm again going to re delete this request because we already have one that's pre-built. I just wanted to show you how the auth panel works. So we go into our create user request and here we have again, as we had in the weather application, um, this input by field. And as you remember, we gave it the attribute sign up email. So we were able to select it simply from our input fields over here. Same with password, we entered sign up password. And uh, if we would want, we could also add more user information. So we could add, for example, a name or um, some, some further information that we um, request from our users. Uh, we're not gonna do that for this example, but Superbase would allow you to do that in that one request. And now we want to make sure, of course, that this uh, sign up request is being triggered properly. So we again go to actions. Um, I already created a couple of folders here just to structure them um, a little bit more in order. Um, and we go to our sign up here and we have our trigger sign up. And again, this applies to our sign up button. And our configuration is on click, perform request, create user just as it was before with our weather application. And I save this and I would just try save it right out. So let me go to sign up over here and uh, let me check in Superbase and make sure that we don't have any users. So we have no users in our project right now and we are signing up a new user right now. So I will go into here and just put in my email address, set a new password. And now I click sign up. And that brought us to the login screen. Why did it brought us to the login screen? Because we defined it to redirect us. So in the data, data out setting here, create user, um, you can see there's an alpha request action that navigates us 
to the slash URL, which is our login URL. And again, it checked for the request to be successful. Um, so we are now being brought back to the login screen. And that's also a particularity from Superbase. So for example, if you use our Airtable authentication or Firebase authentication, it allows you to log in the user directly after signing up. With Superbase, you need to, first of all, confirm the email of the user. And that's why it didn't log you in directly. I will now open another tab, my email window, and uh, click on the confirm email uh, message. And uh, now you can see there was an access token being passed and uh, we will be logged in in the background. All right, uh, let me go back to the login functionality in here. Let's say we didn't create a new request, uh, we didn't create a new user, but we just want to log in again as an existing user. Then we simply um, yeah, would use this login user request that we also created through our authentication panel here. In the login user request, we again use base authentication, use base auth, sign in with email, and we put in our email and our login password. Basically, again, the attributes that we specified before in our Webflow projects, our Webflow project. And then what we do over here is we make sure that after the request, we navigate to our dashboard, but of course, also only if our login request is successful. So we can try out this request. And just for showing you what happens if I don't input the right data and we get an error, um, I will try this out. So let me just put in an email that doesn't exist and is not valid, and then some wrong password. Then we get the error message, invalid login credentials. And we get that because of the response of our request in here of the um, login user request was message invalid login credentials. And we basically have an action that displays this message inside of this text box here whenever it's present. So let's put over here. In login, show login error. Um, we again have applied it to our login error message. Um, and we set the visibility to true if um, the request has executed and isn't um, with a status 200. And then we set the text uh, to plain text to the error message we got back. And that makes sure we get our errors displayed. Um, if we now input the right user credentials, we will be brought back to our uh, dashboard. Boom. And we're there. Also note, um, maybe you have seen a slight content flash over here. That's just because we are in the configurator. They don't appear on your um, live site. So if you go to preview and would repeat that process, you wouldn't see the content flash. It's just a, a thing that we need um, in our configurator to make everything work for you. Nice. All right. As we can all see, this is incredibly customizable. You can really set up any kind of flow any type of rules to create the web app that you want. Let's jump into some questions about what is possible with WISD. There's some people asking about specific use cases, and I think it's valuable to go over them and say WISD can do this or it isn't for this. Mm -hmm. And also, if you're watching live, it seems that the recorded video or the, the live video is about five to eight minutes before all of the live comments. Don't know why, but just stick with us. The record, the, the actual finished product will be all good. Let's bring up one from Mike Burns. Mike Burns asked, is it possible to build a streaming slash membership service like NBA League Pass, like a, a sports gaming area mm -hmm. where members can watch live games in the app and then update scores in real time. So they're watching the game, and then in real time, those scores are updating in the app. So generally, that is possible. Um, you can embed live videos. That would basically just require you to embed some streaming um, software or application, like, for example, YouTube Live, um, where you could just embed a live stream. And then the, the second part would be the updating of the scores. 
And that might maybe require one or two lines of custom code just to get the Firebase trigger um, to fire when those scores update. But it's probably a really often used use case, and we will have a, a simple guide for that uh, with the copyable code that you can use to establish this Firebase connection that is basically, a, or a Firebase or Superbase connection. Those two are actually the ones that um, support those kinds of requests. So um, Xano, for example, or Airtable, those databases will not require, uh, will not support um, basically real-time changes and listeners. But Superbase and, and Firebase are the integrations that support it. And you can basically create a listener uh, with two lines of code, and then you just need to use the WIST um, JavaScript API to trigger the request um, with this listener. Uh, but it's a, it's probably um, yeah done in two minutes. It's a thing that we will offer a guide for in the future. And that brings up a nice question from Parker Thompson. Parker's asking, what led you to choose Superbase in this example as an integration instead of databases like Sano or Airtable? Any specific reasons? Uh, to be honest, no specific reasons. Um, this use case could, can be built with all of them. It can even be built with Airtable. Um, it's just about us bringing us different examples. We showed Airtable in the example before. We showed REST APIs in the example before as well. So this one was about Superbase. And it's also true that Airtable is usually not the best use case if you have a lot of records, if you need speed, if, yeah, the, the, this Airtable is great to use for a lot of use cases and it will work well in Wiz. But if you're building a really complex application, you have a lot of things going on and you need that speed, we're finding much better results with Superbase and Xano. Yes, the requests are just instant um, by Superbase. And in Firebase and Xano, you get request times of 500 to 150 milliseconds. With Airtable, as a comparison, it can be from 600 to 1,000 milliseconds per request. Yeah, and that's a big difference. Where that's that's the difference of content flashing and content not flashing. Yes, and you can try it out yourself as well um, with times all the requests that are executed. So when you go to our um, weather clonable application over here, we can simply see how long this request took us to execute. So for example, if I type in a new city, let's put it up New York again. Oh. I, I broke the um, action before. That's why it's not working right now. Um, <laughs> I will just uh, put in this, trigger this uh, request manually over here. So, Let's just get the request here. Okay. Okay, let me just put in some city name here in New York and uh, time this request. Okay, probably there's some internet connection uh, issue over here or we just broke it with the, with the action itself. Um, but what I wanted to show you is already here. So you can basically see the time it took this integration to respond. So this REST API took 200 milliseconds to reply to our query, basically. And it's uh, it's not Airtable in that case, it's some custom REST API, but um, yeah, you can always compare different tools, compare different requests. It would also vary probably a little bit on your location in the world. So if you do a request from Australia, it might be different times than from the US or Europe, um, but you can try out yourself all the different services and see what works for your application the best. Great. Let's go with some more use case questions. We have one from Penny. Penny says, will it be possible to do signed documents within WISD? For example, connecting a product like HelloSign. So um, it's hard for me to answer that question 100% because I haven't used HelloSign before and don't know exactly how they integrate in a website. But I just assume uh, right now that they have a JavaScript API for their integration. And then you can simply use their JavaScript API and with JavaScript API with a custom, with a few custom lines of code and bring them together. Let's bring one up from David Carl Design. Question. 
Would there be a way of using Gumroad membership keys to validate logins within WISD? Um, I assume Gumroad has an API to validate those keys, a REST API, and that would allow you to validate those keys with WISD, yes. So we can see from these last two answers, if that platform supports integrating with the API, then yes, we can integrate with that API. So yeah, it, it most likely, yes, we can do that. But for this use case, for any use case, we'd have to actually look at that documentation and make sure that Gumroad or HelloSite allows okay. us to do that. Yes, and, and please tell us, um, uh, please continue to tell us about those use cases. Like whenever we, re we receive information from you, we collect it, we process it internally, and we evaluate if we want to release resources for that specific use case. So whatever um, you want to build, share it with us, we collect it internally. And the more people ask, the sooner tutorials for it get released. Okay. Uh, let's bring this up from KevCraft. KevCraft is asking, can the error message be more precise to highlight the exact field that has the error? So what I did over here in this um, uh, error message on the login was just displaying what Superbase returned to us. So it wasn't any custom error message, any custom logic that we implemented ourselves. It was just using the default Superbase um, return, basically uh, error return. And um, this, um, I think in this specific use case, this error message is vague by reason um, because it increases the chances of an attack if they know exactly if the email address was correct or the password was incorrect. So it's, it's vague by intention by Superbase. But in generally, I think those tools like Firebase and Superbase try to give you back the most detailed information about what was wrong in your request. And Xano does the same. So if you um, get back an error from Xano, Xano always tells you uh, which field was missing, which field was maybe invalid, and that also helps. And that leads really well into a Dennis Carr question. I just saw a specified dropdown with Superbase auth. Is this a predefined section of WISD or is using Superbase or using Superbase is injected by the API? So uh, Superbase is not injected by the API. Superbase is added to your site by our embed that you integrate with one line into your Webflow site. And um, the way you configure Superbase authentication is again, in your auth tab, you select the app that you want to use for authentication in your, in your project. And then it gives you predetermined uh, request types. And those request types that are put out by, um, by this authentication uh, drop down here, change based on the app that you want to use for authentication. So let's, for example, go into our um, project over here. And if we select Airtable, for example, over here, it will give us a different variety of requests to work with. And for Airtable, for example, we also need to set the user location in our basis. So um, yeah, it's different from every integration, but um, it will basically guide you through and you fill out and check out all the selections that Wiz is presenting you on that side, on that panel. Um, it will guide you through and basically we will pretty much foolproof. Let's bring this up from attention digital marketing. So much possibility, so excited to get my hands on this and start pushing Webflow. Thank you for this comment. And if you missed the beginning of this stream, there is a pinned chat item on the chat. That's an Airtable form. This is how you can get early access to the early access. So if you really want to get into Wiz V2, you want to start using it, you want to start building, go ahead and fill out that form. We're going to be hand selecting the most passionate users to start using the platform first. We're going to give them premier service. We're going to give everything that we can do to make sure the most passionate people are here to stay. So go ahead, fill out that form, tell us why you should be a user and you will get access before others. And also thank you for sticking around. Uh, I know that we had some serious technical issues as we were filming this. 
If you go and watch the recorded playback, everything should be fine. And actually, uh, I'm going to talk to Gabe behind the scenes here. Gabe, do we let this play for another five minutes or do we just end the stream? Because from my understanding, the playback is just a little bit more delayed than the chat. I don't know. I'll leave it up to you. But we are at the top of the hour. And Jonas, I will ask you, how did this go? What do you what's on your mind right now as you're you're previewing Wiz V2 to the community? Yeah, for me it's incredible to see Wiz in action. Uh, we have worked it on it for, for so many months and uh, just to see everything coming together. Those were pretty simple examples of what you can build with Wiz. Um, there are much more complex uh, examples which involve list rendering, lists inside of list rendering, and all those complex features also, uh, some of them weren't available in, in the previous version of WIST. Um, and we, we crafted so much um, of our effort into making them available and basically bring all the features that were missing in the previous versions. And um, yeah, it's just incredible seeing it uh, coming together and uh, using it for for, for real-time clonables and uh, projects and just to see it really working and uh, being live. Amazing. So many people are excited about this. We are so excited to get it in your hands, but we're going to do it the right way. So no rushing. And don't forget, we are in the same room here. I'm here in the same frame. We're sitting right next to each other because we are in Florida, United States for State of Flow. If you are going to State of Flow, tell us in the comments. Uh, let us know. We're going to be there. We're going to be talking Wiz. We're going to be talking FinSuite, Attributes, Client First. It all works together. So this has been a great stream. I really hope that everybody has filled out that form and is just super excited to get started because I know that we are excited. So at this time, we will end the stream and have a great rest of the day. We'll see you on Friday. Thursday stream is not happening. Friday, we're talking about integrating Spelt into Webflow. Have a great day. Talk to you soon and see you later.